You are listening to Medicine and the Machine with Medscape Editor-in-Chief Eric Topol and Master Storyteller and Clinician Abraham Verghese as they talk with experts around the globe about the hottest topics in healthcare. This podcast is intended for U.S. healthcare professionals only. This is Eric Topol for Medscape with my co-host uh, Abraham Verghese, and we're delighted to have with us today uh, professor Jeremy Camille, who is a associate professor at Louisiana State University uh, in immunology and virology, especially got expertise in virology, which we need right now. We're going to be talking to him about that extensively, not just about the COVID pandemic, but the other viruses we're confronting uh, right now. So Jeremy, it's great to have you on board. It's an honor to be here, truly. Thank you, uh, Eric and Abraham, for having me on. I thought we'd start uh, not in, in sequence, but we're going to get into sequence too, because that's a new big part of uh, your interest. But right now, polio is a big worry. And uh, the concern out there is the language of uh, vaccine-derived uh, polio. And obviously, uh, if you could put in context, where are we with polio that arrived in New York uh, and it's now been declared a public health emergency there, and this connection with the vaccine. Well, I think it's it's important um, for most Americans to to realize, and I think a lot of physicians as well. I'm not a medical doctor, but my impression among physicians as well is that polio is something that, in the United States at least, we had a sense that we had defeated it, um, and it, it was a scourge that was in the in its last throes. Uh, being extinguished in you know, rural parts of India and whatnot, and Africa. Unfortunately, um, n although in this country we, we use inactivated polio vaccine, in other countries, there's live polio vaccine. So Sabin, I think was the, that was Sabin versus Salk, right? And you guys are in, in San Diego, La Jolla, so you have the Salk Institute. So um, the, the, those two were, I guess, arc, arc, nem arc nemeses. <laughs> and um, so in certain countries, the, the Sabin vaccine is still used and it's more efficacious than the killed vaccine. Uh, the problem is that as um, when children are given the live polio vaccine, the virus can actually evolve stepwise little by little to become a little bit closer to wild type or dangerous polio. And so what looks to have happened here is that in countries that use live, live polio vaccine, the virus has become a, a lot more like wild type polio. It's still vaccine derived and it's not the vaccine that's causing the disease. So I think, I think Americans and listeners need to understand that people aren't given the vaccine and coming down with poliomyelitis. It's that the virus in certain countries that use live vaccine has been able to uh, reacquire some of its na natural polio virus like qualities and is spreading as polio naturally did fecal oral. And it's a rugged virus, it's hard to get rid of. And in countries like the US, we got rid of it because of very high vaccination rates. And unfortunately, we now live in an era with um, untold levels of skepticism about public health, um, a lot of doubts about whether the CDC can be trusted, which is really sad. I mean, before the COVID-19 pandemic, we already had vaccine hesitant parents or and even activists who were against all vaccines. And you now have people talking about whether germs really cause disease again. So it, it's, it reminds me of Carl Sagan and the demon haunted world. <laughs> you end up having a self-fulfilling prophecy with these people you know, coming out with half truths or, or um, you know, very sad distortions of, of, of what's real and valid. And now there's all these Americans who don't have polio virus immunity because they chose not to have the vaccine or chose to not have their children get it. And they're sitting ducks to have, you know, these low probability outcomes on individual level, but you get enough people with polio virus exposure and some of them are gonna get poliomyelitis, which is an irreversible paralytic disease. So now we know that this virus has made it, it, was, it showed up in England, vaccine derived polio and now we're seeing it in New York City, I think in large numbers and other parts of the US. So it's a grave concern. Just to follow yeah. up on that, uh, may I ask, do you think this virus has the capacity to further evolve and to actually produce 
paralytic polio uh, as it evolved? I mean, I, I'll, I'll preface by saying I'm not an expert in vaccine-derived polio or poliomyelitis. I study cytomegalovirus professionally. But from what I've read, it sounds like there's definitely a concern that this could happen um, and that this will happen if we don't get immunization rates back up. Yeah, I know. I grew up in a country where we did use live polio vaccines, and there was always a small percentage of people who would, in fact, get, you know, sort of a form for us of polio. But uh, the numbers were never very clear. So this is really alarming. Yes, definitely. Definitely and alarming. One of the interesting things about polio that isn't generally appreciated is that there's a, a vast majority of cases are asymptomatic, something like 70%. Most people have this idea that, oh, gosh, if you get polio virus, you're paralyzed. <laughs> uh, and that's just not the case. So, um, yeah, so we're not done with this virus now, unfortunately. It's, it's making a comeback, and it's sad that this is happening, and I think you've explained the mechanism well, and uh, Abraham's highlighted, you know, where this could even go further. Before we get to um, SARS-CoV-2, uh, if we could turn to monkeypox, um, this seems to be on the decline, um, and I wonder... Uh, what your thoughts are, where we stand with the monkeypox um, pandemic? Well, I think the first thing we need to do is really be accurate about how it's spreading, because there seemed to be some confusion early on about whether this was a new airborne pox virus, because we know that smallpox was much, much more transmissible and, and could be transmitted efficiently be, between humans by in, in more, more, more modalities. What appears to be happening with monkeypox is that this has evolved into a, sexu a largely sexually transmitted infection and that it was uh, predominantly spreading within um, communities of men who have sex with men and not just, not just gay men, but men who have, who have a lot of partners. So the gay community deserves a huge amount of respect and applause for um, spreading the information among each other and, and getting the correct messages out about how this virus is spreading and increasing awareness about the importance of getting vaccinated. And I think that it's that campaign and the willingness of that community to be really honest and forthright and get push, push aside all the stigma and shame and just call things by their true name, acknowledge what's happening and deal with it forthright. Because it reminds me of ring vaccination, really. Be, Ring vaccination was so effective in dealing with smallpox because in Africa, they, they, they figured out that if you go to where there's an outbreak and immunize people near the outbreak, you can, you, can, you can stamp it out early, even if you don't have enough doses to say, immunize everyone on the continent or in the country. And in this case, we have a disease that's spreading within um, one community. It's not a geography. But by dealing with the people who are in contact and in high risk, first, you can stop the, the virus from spreading. And indeed, cases are going way down in the US and in Europe, and, and, and I think in all geographies where, you can, where we have accurate data. So uh, I think that's the situation with, with, with monkeypox. It is really fascinating to see. Uh, it was, I mean, indeed for myself, I, I'm not an, a, a pox virologist, and I, I wasn't so familiar with epidemiology before this you know, hit the news. But what I learned from, from hearing from people who do study it is that this virus had been uh, endemic in Africa and had been a problem in, in, in various West and Central African countries like Nigeria for decades. And the West had not done much to address it or to help out. And so what, it, what happened is that that virus kept spilling over from I guess, uh, certain types of rodents that harbor it. They're not like squirrels or rats that we see in the US. These are different types of rodents that are endemic to Africa, but it was spilling periodically from rodents into humans and it would cause problems. And, and some years there were worse outbreaks than others. Ironically, the, the same year that uh, the FDA approved the drug TPOX or te Tecoviramat, I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. Uh, this is an antiviral drug that's effective against smallpox and was, was uh, produced and developed to address the threat that maybe a terrorist organization or a rogue nation like say North Korea might 
synthesize or come up with a way to release smallpox, bring it back. And so we'd have some biodefense capacity to, to stop that early. So we, we stockpiled this drug and, and the FDA approved it for that purpose. But we lost the opportunity to say, hey, there's an ongoing outbreak of, of monkeypox, which is another orthopox virus that we expect this drug to work against. Why not offer to help out in Africa and do a clinical trial there? No one bothered to help out in Nigeria that was having an active um, outbreak. And I, I learned uh, from an article in Nature Medicine uh, yesterday, a news piece that, in fact, we don't have great evidence in humans that this drug works. As, as, as we, We'd like to have better clinical evidence that's effective. We expect it to, but it's always important to have that data. So it seems like a lost opportunity and also a lesson that by if we ignore the needs, the, the health needs of, of people in poorer countries, in fact, we do that at our own peril. What do you know about the vaccine for monkeypox? Is it uh, sort of like smallpox, a variola type, you know, modified live vaccine? So I think there's two versions, right? There's a more classical uh, vaccinia-like vac vaccine, which is a, a little bit higher risk for people who have eczema or other kinds of skin issues. And then there's the newer one, which is called Geneos, which is, I think it's manufactured in Europe. Uh, and that's the one that the CDC is, is uh, making available for immunization to high-risk people. And so that is given subdermally. I think, it, I think it's somewhat like the, um, the, the classical inoculation, but I don't know if it's a bifurcated needle. I remember there was some controversy when the FDA uh, uh, authorized the use of uh, a dose sparing regimen. So there's only so many doses available and there's this intradermal type of inoculation which uses one fifth the amount of, of vaccine. And, and so they're, they're rolling out that that approach to giving it so they can give more doses, which sounds like a reasonable thing to do. But um, I think Genea, the advantage of this Geneos version is that it's less likely to cause problems in people who have skin conditions like eczema. Uh, and that's, that's at least my understanding of it as a, as a non-expert on that topic. Right. Yeah, well, it seems like all the virologists, they, they like to pick one virus family that they... <laughs> Uh, and then you have to come out of your comfort zone because even though you were uh, an authority on CMV, you had to come, uh, you become a coronavirus uh, SARS-CoV-2 expert over the last few years, right? Yeah, expertise is always relative. I mean, there's people that that if I'm in the same room with, say, Florian Kramer or Ben Hurley, uh, even though those two people aren't traditionally coronavirologists, and or I could say Thomas Gallagher, who is. Those people I would consider relative to myself authentic experts on uh, COVID nineteen, but uh, we all we all gain information from firsthand experiences, and, and you know no one starts out day zero as an expert in anything. You become an expert first of all, ironically, by admitting how little you know at the outset and being curious and listening to others. And I think um, if if I've learned anything useful or gained any valid information, it's, it's by starting small and acknowledging what I do and don't know. And of course, applying what I learned from, about other viruses to this situation. Well, yeah, we don't have much of that these days. We need more. That brings me actually to social media for a moment, because you're a macro leader on social <laughs> media. How did you get to be macro leader? And what is your view of uh, the whole world uh, of Twitter? Oh, Twitter is, is a, a, funny, a funny place. I'll get to that in a second. So macro, macro leader was because I, I'm a virologist and we pipette small amounts of fluids like micro leaders and micro leader was taken already. So I just came up with a pun. <laughs> of course, there's no such thing as a macro leader, but it is, it is funny, ironically in biology, you often use a tiny little model that gives you insights into something more universal. So it, it's, it's sort of a twist on that, like the tiny thing can become macro, uh, but I don't want to be, try to be poetic about it. It was just, I didn't, didn't put a lot of thought into it. I was like, micro leaders taken, I'll go with macro leader. Oh, it's available. Okay. And, and so that's where that came from. Twitter is an amazing tool for sharing information and, get, and getting information from others. Uh, I guess it's, they call it a micro blogging service. I, uh, I don't do Facebook anymore, even though that was really useful to track what I, you know, my, what my relatives and friends from high school were up to. Um, but I found Twitter really useful to follow what's happening in science. 
And as a virologist, which is really an inter interdisciplinary field, because as a virologist, you need to know cell biology. And then there's all these things that are happening in cryo EM and bioinformatics and uh, deep sequencing or next gen sequencing that are applicable to your work. And so as a scientist here, especially in remote Northwest Louisiana, it, it's really important to keep abreast of developments in the field or tools that could save you a lot of time or give you a unique insight. So, you know, to, to learn things and discover things. So I found Twitter to be useful for that. Uh, it, it, by following people who are productive and or uh, other curious people in fields related to yours. You can learn a lot quickly, come up with techniques that save your grad students a little bit of time in the lab. And then, you know, COVID-19 hit. And I think that um, only showed uh, or, or only underscored or emphasized even more how powerful Twitter could be. Uh, it was the first days of the pandemic. And I learned quickly that Florian Kramer was sharing plasmids to express the spike RBD and full length spike so that you could do ELISAs and detect who had seroconverted. And a friend of mine, uh, Ben Hurley, who I'd known in the pre-Twitter uh, era because I met his one of his students who discovered the NEPA and Hendra virus receptor at a, a ASV, an American Society for Virology conference back in, I think, 2005. So I knew who Ben Hur Lee was and I'd gotten plasmids from his lab and I, I had in, gotten to interact on Twitter with him a little bit before the pandemic invited him to come out and give a seminar, which of course had canceled because of the travel restrictions. But he shared with our with my lab and with our campus a, um, a vesicular stomatitis virus reverse genetic system that lets, or a, a neutralization assay basically, that let you test for neutralization activity in people's blood without having to do a BSL-3 setup or a, even a BSL-2 enhanced setup. You could just do it at BSL-2. So all these amazing people were out there on Twitter sharing knowledge and information and sometimes reagents. And it was really interesting at the very outset of the pandemic when you saw a lot of selflessness, just people saying, hey, this is a public health emergency. My lab developed these standards or controls or tools and we're happy to share them. So it was a great way to learn how, how to connect with other people and, and bring resources that were unique and powerful to your community, even if it was far away geographically from somewhere else. Uh, so that, that's, that's what Twitter was really useful for. But then of course it has a dark side as well because just as useful information can move very quickly on Twitter, uh, deceptive or um, misleading information uh, seems to move even faster. So there's, um, I'm trying to learn to not react when I see stuff that is way out of line or way out there, but sometimes I still, yeah, I'm still triggered. And so I, I try to, you know, set the record straight on, on, on incorrect or alarmist uh, and takes on, hey, this is this new variant we found, everyone's gonna die in two weeks. And, you know, so far that hasn't happened, but it's been announced, you know, countless times since the beginning of the pandemic. Yeah, we've had a lot of doomsday variants out there for sure. Yeah. Yes. You were sort of a pioneer early on in pushing for sequencing, you know, the different uh, viruses that were endemic in different areas and yeah. encountered some resistance, I imagine, initially, but uh, it turned out exactly. tremendously helpful. Uh, talk a little bit about those, those early days, and I, I sort of want to get to where you think we are now. Uh, you know, do you think that we've, I, I think I may have read a, a tweet from you suggesting that maybe that severe disease is no longer something that we may we should worry about necessarily. I mean, if one has to predict, it's hard to predict. And I'm hearing the same sentiment from the WHO that the sense that you know we may be on top of this. So I'd be very curious to get your both your thoughts actually on this. Well, thank you for um, thank you for that. That's a really insightful comment. And I was I mean again lucky through Twitter, and it was really you know seeing uh, the activity from folks like Christian Anderson and many folks in the GISAID community who are sequencing all around the world. Um, Emma Hodcroft from Next Strain, who, who active on Twitter, Trevor Bedford. Those folks early on, I saw active very early. I remember I was visiting friends in, I think it was San Francisco right around New Year's and already there was some, some chatter from the phylogenetics community putting these viruses on trees. 
And at that point, I wasn't even convinced the virus was going to show up in the United States, but these sequences were, were out there and, and people were already gaining insights from them. And so when they shut down our campus, it was, I think it was actually literally Friday the 13th, March 13th, 2020. Um, and, but they had already asked, the chancellor had asked the virologists or a few of us, you know, hey, do you know what RT-PCR is? <laughs> RT-QPCR, real-time PCR. And for us, that's a pretty boring, uh, not that exciting new, it's not an exciting new technique. It's, it's pretty um, boilerplate basic thing to set up that you, you know, I mean, it's not just used in virology, it's used to look at gene expression differences. So we were like, yeah, of course, it's not hard to set up an RT-PCR uh, assay, uh, but we were charged and there was, as a state university, we were um, asked by the governor and also uh, the, the, the senator from, one of the senators from our state, Bill Cassidy, I think was involved in routing some funds because there were not um, coronavirus tests that were reliable. So uh, we were asked to, hey, set up a PCR testing center. So this involved buying lots of PCR machines and making the largest orders I've ever done for primers. Usually you buy it at like, you know, to, uh, the smallest synthesis scale possible. But I, I got to see the ID, IDT is the company I'd buy, I used to buy primers from since grad school, UC Davis, 1998. So I was going to the drop down menu and seeing what side of, how big the synthesis scale you could order at. And so I was like, wow, someone should be buying stock in that company. But because uh, other people, of course, are gonna be ordering lots of primers. Uh, so we were ordering primers and machines to detect. And then uh, at the end of those days, just frantically ordering stuff. Uh, when I, I was just up a little bit late and I think it was around March 20th or so. And I, I just decided, to, I was like, huh, well, if we're doing all these PCR assays and we're gonna find positives, shouldn't we be sequencing? Shouldn't we figure out how to do that? It sounded like a challenge because, of course, there's only minute amounts of nucleic acids in, in a patient sample. But I, I knew from people in my field that folks knew how to do this using panels and, and enrichment uh, strategies. And so I just sent an email to my department chair and the vice chancellor for research, like saying, hey, we should really you know, start, start thinking about sequencing this. And the vice chancellor loved the idea uh, and said, hey, just get it done. I got your back. And uh, I wrote an IRB, it took a little while, but by um, May, early May, we were uploading uh, data to GISAID. We had gotten our first uh, complete genomes and luckily we, I was introduced to Christian Anderson and, and Bob Gary from, by uh, Emma Hodcroft and Nate Grubaugh. And so we, we got to be on a paper with them describing the outbreak in Louisiana. And it was really just neat seeing those little dots on the, phylogenetic trees pop up. And of course, they also have technology to look at how the virus is moving through space and time. So you can also model the transmissions. And it was just fascinating because immediately our, we already saw mutations in the re receptor binding domain. I remember we were like the first people to see a, a F490L mut mutant in the United States. And at the time, no one was worried about that. And you're exactly right, Abraham. People were like, there was a lot of pushback, like, hey, this is a waste of time. This virus doesn't, doesn't mutate very fast. And that seemed to be true. You'd see these little sparks and changes in the RBD, but nothing was sticking. And then by December or November, when uh, the alpha variant was first identified, B117, it became clear that variants were gonna be an issue. And you know, here we are, so many variants of concern later. You know, <laughs> we're in sublineages of Omicron now that have you know each driven their own wave. Uh, so that that was interesting. And I've 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 had a crash course sort of in the politics of data sharing because uh, I don't think that our country's national health leaders, even Francis Collins uh, type folks, realistically grasped yet the importance of correct incentive. As scientists, we usually put data out there after we publish a paper, or we, we put it up there in GenBank and ask for it to be embargoed until a paper is accepted. And that was never um, something that we were gonna do with our data. I, I knew we had to get it out there immediately. But what I, what I noticed is that even though LSU Health Report at that time especially wasn't known for viral genomics or anything like that, the edge we had was that we shared rapidly. Other campuses had been generating data, amassing sequences, but they weren't sharing them. 
they were doing what you know they've been trained with what you're rewarded to i mean people learn lessons by living life and as a scientist a lot of people learn the lesson hold on to that data until you can get something for it and so those are the ingrained practices among most scientists and i think you know eric has been a leader in looking at how technology changes medicine and, and society especially when it comes to genome sequencing and i think that's a, a very contemporary issue right now as you know, we see with cars, with Teslas are changing, you know, how people drive cars. Well, there's now little nanopore devices that, you know, at some, someday and probably in my own lifetime in the next decade, we'll all have, at least people in wealthier countries may all have a nanopore-like thing, a, a Oxford nanopore minion in their kitchen to look at, to find out what kind of cold they have. We're not there yet, but I think the future is, is, to, is a less patronizing situation where, you don't have to go to the doctor to find out what virus you have. Your doctor is your partner and you have electronic access to that person who can diagnose and guide you. But the technology to find out what virus is in your nose, it shouldn't require going to a health center, filling out lots of paperwork, paying a copay, all that. There's a lot of barriers to, to getting this data, but if we can generate it in real time, we could detect pandemics more quickly. We wouldn't have to wait to find out, oh, someone's in the hospital with a pneumonia. Well, before that person showed up with a pneumonia, who's maybe an elderly person or immunocompromised person, some virus was moving like wildfire causing mild illnesses. And we're not seeing those events happen. In fact, if you go on to GenBank, there's like only 60 human coronavirus 229E, that's one of the seasonals, complete genomes available in the entire world. That's a virus that causes a lot of colds yet we only have 60 genomes or so. Uh, it's, it's a disgrace. We've had the technology for a long time to, to do public health at genome level with viruses. And indeed, we're already at the stage where we can do single cell sequencing on zebrafish and mice and Drosophila to study development or immune responses. I mean, if we're doing in, entire like single cell uh, transcriptomes, for research purposes, why aren't we applying this, this kind of firepower to public health questions? And I think it goes back to what Abraham was saying early on is people kind of look down upon, well, you're just sequencing for the sake of sequencing. What's the point of that? What's your research question? Sometimes, you know, I, I love hypothesis driven research. I think it's super important. But when you have a, a, a new telescope technology, sometimes you have to point it at the sky and see stuff about moons on Jupiter that you didn't see before. I mean, no, no one's asking NASA to justify why they're pointing a new powerful telescope deep into space, but we're asking biologists to, hey, hold off on that sequencing technology that now can figure out the entire transcriptome of a cell for pennies, because you don't have a hypothesis. It's like, hey, sometimes you just have to look before you can even say that something interesting is going on. It's just like the first, you know, Leeuwenhoek and, and looking at pond water with the first microscope, you saw all these life forms that you didn't realize were there. Um, I think we're at the same juncture with sequencing, but basic investments aren't being made in terms of the social practices. And I mean, people are hiring lots of brilliant phylogeneticists, but no one's talking to sociologists and economists to, to say, hey, how can we put systems in place so that people will actually generate and share this information in real time? Because that was actually the failure early on in the pandemic was detecting that a new virus was out there. And, and it was, you know, I think, a huge missed opp opportunity because the technology was already there. The systems and the social systems and the incentives, I'd argue, are still missing. Oh, no question about that. But, you know, just to take the sequencing story further, uh, it's been extraordinary. I think there's, what, how many 12 million sequences of the virus uh, or more now? Yeah, I think it just crossed 13 million. 13 in million, yeah, yeah, and Jason. So... Um, what we've seen now has been extraordinary. That is, uh, being able to track the virus spatial temporally around the world, the variants, uh, even being able to connect the dots between what monoclonal antibody you should get if you have this particular variant. Because, of course, as you know very well, there are differences in the immune response or immune escape with the different variants. So one of the things that comes up now is that we have these new variants, you've touched on it, Jeremy, 
like uh you know ba2.20.2 and you know they, they have they they have from scary freaking mutations you know yep. all over the place the ones we haven't seen and um the question is you know do you call them a scary until are all variants innocent until proven otherwise that is just because you detect them should you should you even should you just keep quiet about it until they actually show signs of spread what's your philosophy about what to do about all these very worrisome uh, mutations you know these these new um lineages sub lineages that seem like they could be very troubling but yet haven't re really taken hold i think that's a brilliant question because there's not one clear answer i'd say there's a number of different criteria with omicron if you looked at it on a phylogenetic tree it was like a space alien almost and just detecting one of those, you would say, oh, is, is someone's sequencing machine broken? This is too weird, you know? Um, but, but if you know that the sequence data is reliable and it's, it's, that, it's got that long of a branch off of anything else that's been detected, I think just the, the change alone in the spike, because we know all those, there's so many epitopes that are critical for neutralization, that's concerning in and of itself because of the huge number of changes out the blue. Otherwise, if you look at something like Delta, it would be, I mean, it had a decent number of, of mutation. I think it had about eight substitutions on the spike, um, maybe a little more when it first showed up, but it wasn't a remarkably huge number relative to others that had been found. And it was only really in seeing how it performed in so many different geographies that, that gave us the signal to say, hey, this thing isn't just a fluke of India. It's, it's showing up in a lot of different places and it's displacing the existing variants. And so that's how we knew that it was gonna drive a wave early on. And I, I, was, I was a skeptic of it because I think it's, it is safer to be the skeptic with a new variant, as you said, because most of the time people are tweeting or are worried about something, it, it turns out to not be um, as bad as it sounds. I mean, even with the beta variant, uh, the, which, which, which was first, detect, like, first detected like so many of the important ones by Tulio de Oliveira and, and his team in South Africa. And, they, and for good reason, they don't like to call it the South African variant because South Africa is just the place that has the brightest lights on. They're, they're, they're doing the best job with surveillance. Indeed, most of those variants probably come from other countries in, Afri in the African continent. But anyway, that, that beta variant up until Omicron was the most immunovasive one. But even though it reached places like California and other countries, it never really drove a global wave. So even know, even having that laboratory data on immunoevasiveness isn't enough to tell you that this, this virus is gonna be the next uh, big one. So you have to have multiple criteria and I think there are, there's a good cause to, to use multiple independent bases for saying, hey, we should be concerned about this. But I think at the end of the day, the proof is always in the pudding. It's just unfortunate that you have to actually see a wave on the uptick before you can say, ah, we're in trouble. I mean, that's, that's sort of that last criteria, seeing that it's competitive in multiple geographies is, is sort of um, a sad one to have to resort to, but it is, it is the ultimate, um, it is the ultimate indicator. Just to pin both of you guys down, do you sense that given the level of natural infection out there, the level of vaccination and the fact that many of these scariants have not sort of taken hold, is it in fact reasonable to state what the WHO had just stated that he really thought we were getting to this, you know, not disease free state, but at least a, a state of entropy or equanimity with this virus, if you like? Yeah, detente. Um, I, I agree with you. And it, it, it gets really controversial, again, on social media, because people say, well, what about the immunocompromised people? You know, how can you, you're such an ableist to say that, to say what's, to just observe what is true is that once someone's vaccinated and been infected, they're, they are resistant, usually, to getting another bout of severe disease. They may get infected a second time. And if they're an, of, you know, unless they have a health problem, if they recover, if they're vaccinated and have had two infections, it's gonna be very hard for them to have a third that's severe. And most people are not walking around with shrunken brains and unable to do their work. Some people are having 
lingering symptoms. And I'm reading literature about you know uh, serotonin and and other neurotransmitters being on the table there as even people who had uh, serotonin deficiency or depression first before they got infected are, are showing up with more issues like long COVID. So I don't wanna trivialize the importance of the long syndromes, but absolutely it seems to be the case that once, once there's been enough waves and enough vaccination, uh, the virus, the threat of the virus goes way down. It's not zero, but it is, it is low enough that um, the general public is not gonna be concerned about it. So it doesn't matter in some ways how, uh, how much people are up in arms on Twitter saying that you're an ableist or you know, how, we need to wear masks forever be, until the last person will never get sick. Uh, you can say that and it sounds good, but to other people who have that mindset, but it's not realistic for countries to be in a constant state of emergency. And yeah, you need to have people um, able to go about their business. And I'm in Louisiana. We're not necessarily a red state. Our governor is a Democrat, but it is it is more deep south about uh, its COVID response. And they, they dropped masking here in schools in February of this year after the first big BA wave, BA1 wave, uh, the first Omicron wave died down a bit. So my kids weren't wearing masks. I wasn't going to be the, my wife and I weren't going to be the, you know, the whole, the, 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 the two parents who were insisting that our kids be the only one in the class. And our, my children still haven't had COVID, none of them. Um, and my wife hasn't either yet um you know we're, we're doing fine but if you if you go on twitter people will tell you that that everyone who does what we do our our kids are all going to die or have long covid and that hasn't happened so there's you, a lot of things that uh, you see yeah. like everybody's had covid now no that's not true exactly and all kinds of stuff but um you know i think what you're getting at is um it, it potentially at odds with the chance of another omicron like hit another new completely out of the blue, you know, major 30 plus mutations and not just in the spike, but you know, what about the chances for that given we have so many immunocompromised tens of millions of people around the world, we got animal reservoirs, we've got recombinants that are happening every day, we got, you know, every, there's a lot of, there's a, the deck is stacked for potentially another Omicron hit, you don't think so? I don't, I mean, I think that, you know, early on, you'd laugh at people who said, your T cells will protect you. I remember, like, you know, it was very, you know, mid June 2020. And the, the zeitgeist, there were a couple papers that pointed out that in certain people, you know, the S2 domain of the spike has some um, homology to, and I guess some shared T cell epitopes with OC43, which is a seasonal coronavirus. And there are individuals who have very potent T cell responses. And I think that if you actually read um, the, the folks who have looked at the genetic determinants of resistance to severe disease or even to infection, there, I guess there's an HLA allele that's, yeah. uh, you know, one in 10 people have it. And probably you generate a very rapid T cell response that prevents symptomatic infection in those individuals or often prevents it. So early on, people were like, oh, well, T cells will save us. And it, of course it was baloney. And because uh, most people still could get sick, especially if they were ignoring uh, masking all those before the vaccine came out, all those things. So, uh, but at the same, by the same, by the same token, once people have hybrid immunity, it's no longer just about the spike. So you have, you end up with a bunch of tissue resident cells. It's, you know, T cells and B cells and, and probably some innate lymphoid cells and, and NK cells that play roles as well. But you have this in, inside, you know, microscopically in your respiratory tract, you have this family of, of sentinel cells that are specific or to pr protect you from COVID. And if, if you know about the viral life cycle, the very first, protein that's made is not spike, it's ORF1A1B. So that makes all the non-structural proteins that copy the genome and also play roles in immune evasion. One of the things they do is shut off your ribosome. So you can't make your own, your cell can't make its own proteins anymore, only viral proteins. But if your MHC system, your HLA system is presenting epitopes from ORF1A1B, those are gonna be the first opportunities for T cells to, to mount a response. So people who've been infected are gonna have that 
level of protection, even if there's a new super variant that has a, you know, every mutation possible in the spike, those T cell responses are never going to become completely irrelevant. So whatever you learn from being infected does have a great chance to protect you. And that is not an argument against vaccination. That is an argument for vaccination because if you, a breakthrough infection in someone who has spike responses is going to be much milder than, than in someone who doesn't. And so you're going to acquire those other elements of immunity while experiencing probably a more, a more gentle infection, which doesn't mean that some people who are vaccinated won't have bad infections. But overall, we're seeing obviously uh, big, big differences in, in the outcomes for people who are vaccinated versus not. So I'm a little bit skeptical of a new super variant that would cause disease as bad as we saw before the vaccine era. I don't see that happening and I hope I'm right. Well, I hope you're right too, but I think that seems to be anchored on the, the hybrid immunity story. And I think the sad part is there's still plenty of people unvaccinated completely or completely you know, vaccinated and otherwise naive to infections who could be vulnerable, but we'll see. I mean, I hope you're right. And I hope Tedros, Dr. Tedros is right with his proclaim. With, 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 with what Abraham said today is that the end of the pan, of the pandemic is near. You know, it's like I hope so, but I mean, by this point in time, it's it's hard to be uh, having a lot of confidence. Now, um, before we wrap up, I have a couple of things about vaccines I want to get your inputs, and I'm sure Abraham has some other things. But right now, we got the bivalent BA five or BA four or five, but it's really the same spike. Yeah. And, um, you know, half and half a combo with yeah. uh, the original Wuhan strain. And what the, the question here is that that went ahead with no uh, specific human data. Uh, it had mice data. Uh, and people say, well, that's okay, because we do that with flu. Well, you know, okay, <laughs> but I don't think our flu vaccines are all that potent. But no. at any rate, um, so we have this mice data, and we have BA1 data. Uh, with the, in fact, uh, it's going to be published on Friday, I think, in the New England Journal. But wow. um, we also have, um, and beta, we had some beta data, but we had no data for this in humans, right? And so my question here is, back in June, the, the company Moderna and Pfizer, they go to the FDA, they have the BA1 data, you know, it looks pretty good. And the FDA says, the advisor saying, no, no, we don't want that one. We're already long past BA1. We're in the BA5 era. Yep. Go back and get us some BA5. So <laughs> the government orders 171, 171 million doses of BA of the bivalent vaccines between the two companies. And they, they get it ready in two months. Two months. I love yeah. it. But they didn't do any pe people. In two months, they, they had enough vaccine to test in in mice. Couldn't they have tested that in a few people to to at least you know even the optics, the optics of a big campaign program, you know, get us a handful of people, just some data. Now, what's your prediction? Is everything going to be cool here? Um, and was this a misstep, or did you did you go out and have your bivalent vaccine? What do you think? Well, I think the misstep was that. We went from no vaccine to mRNA vaccines in arms that were emergency use authorized in, in what? It took from uh, January 2020 to December to have the actual rollout of the vaccine. So that's about 11 months. And in, in about that same time period, we made no moves for Omicron showing up in November to now that you know November of last year to now we're finally rolling out the bivalent. I would argue that we should we should have been faster up, up updating the vaccine. But I think you're absolutely right that it is important, even just for, for optics and to comfort people that hey we've tested this in some human beings. That why why not pre uh, identify healthcare workers who are willing who are educated enough and you know they understand what mRNA vaccines are, how they work, say, hey, I'm comfortable being a guinea pig for updating the mRNA sequence. It's not that different from the original. Uh, and I'm comfortable to, to be in that clinical trial and show that it's safe and that you know my antibody responses are better. 
why not put in place you know innovative programs like that to match the technological innovations in vaccinology uh, with the regulatory frameworks for approving things so i think you're absolutely right and i think but i also would agree i think with what you hinted at that a ba1 booster probably would have but a ba1 bivalent booster probably would have given us 90 percent of the benefit we're getting with the with a four or five <laughs> that's um, right that's what the might show yeah, I, I believe it. The only the only nice thing is that with four or five, we had this this F four eight six V change, which is gibberish to most people. But that escapes a a really key class of broadly neutralizing antibodies. So there's the chance by having that one in the mix that folks' B cells will uh, be able to update that class of antibodies. I mean, it remains to be seen empirically, which is important. But having that antigen in there may help a little bit uh, yeah. uh, over the BA1 in terms of durability. Uh, but you're absolutely right. I think it was a lost opportunity to roll out uh, the vaccine a little bit sooner. And indeed, people like me ended up catching COVID because wow. in, in that in that window of time when you know I, I I made it through BA1 and most of BA2, but in July I finally got my first case of mm -hmm. COVID. I was lucky that I didn't get very sick from it. Yeah. Uh, but of course, I've had three doses of the original mRNA vaccine. So, yeah, no, I think your point about having had the Omicron vaccine, like that could have been done in two months, yep. as we learned with the BA5, but it just, they sat on it for, and it took seven months to become, you know, for that end of June meeting that should have happened in, you know, February or something like that. Uh, before I hit you about nasal vaccines or mucosal immunity, Abraham, anything? No, I was just going to say that it's, it's a great time to be a biologist. Uh, you guys are like the rock stars of, of, uh, of the scientific world, and, and there's so much coming at us. Yeah, and, I, I'm, and I'm learning from Jeremy all the time. He's, he's really a phenom. And I want to just get your view to really get a hold of this virus. I mean, you may not think it's necessary because you, I, I'm hearing a pretty optimistic um, you know, perspective today, which I love, of course. Mm -hmm. But... Um, you know, the problem is that even this BA5 matched up yep. may do little to have infection or transmission reduction because the, the, the way the virus has evolved, it, it seems to have burned through that, that you know, the, the shots. Uh, they look great for blocking or inhibiting largely infections and transmission. But once we got to Omicron, that basically fell apart. And I don't know that we can get that back through shots. But I do think uh, that there's a realistic chance we could get that through nasal, oral, inhaled vaccines. And we've got a couple that look quite, quite good, at least some of the data we've seen. Would you go after that? Like you, you've been a big proponent of, you know, getting ahead of things or you know, would you would you tr um, think it's worth? The U.S. has made no investment. Many academic labs, like uh, Florian Cremels uh, in Mount Sinai, had gone to Mexico. You know, Washington University went to to India, uh, Yale. I mean, they're all they can't get the United States to, to invest a dime. Do you think it's worth it, or do you think we it really isn't necessary? I think I think it's um, definitely worth it. I mean, you anyone who's read the papers and you've shared so many excellent ones, hybrid immunity really seems to be the key to a more durable response. It's probably not a permanent response because we know from seasonal coronaviruses, people catch them um, periodically. You probably don't catch them every year if you're a normal immunocompetent, but you probably catch OC43 more than once in your life. Um, and same thing with 229 E, and those are those cause nasty colds. So um, I, don't, I don't know if hybrid immunity is so permanent, but it, it probably makes a, a big advantage over just having an intramuscular in, injection and, and generating some, some IgG and T cells that don't know exactly where to go. When you get infected in the respiratory tract, you recruit cells that defend you and they stick around for a lot longer. So I would, I would argue that it's a really good investment to make I think the FDA has an appropriate role here to be cautious and, and make sure that the, you know, that the methods to induce, to recruit cells to the respiratory tract are gonna be different, right? Than, than those, than just sticking a needle in your arm, which is, as I think any, anyone who's been to a pediatrician's office knows, a lot of the vaccines just go intramuscular and there's, there's probably good safety reasons for that. So 
Um, I think if we want to roll out a nasal vaccine, it's got to be safe. And it's not just got to be safe in 80% or 90% or 95% of people who receive them. It's got to be safe in almost everyone. And the concern is, of course, if you put a virus or a viral vector or an inflammatory, a pro-inflammatory um, insult in the lungs or the nasal passages, uh, there's, there's a risk that some people's breathing may be affected, right? Um, so I think the safety issues there are, are maybe a little bit more formidable, but I'm sure smart people have been thinking about this problem and already have ideas and indeed animal data saying that these platforms can be safe. I just, I just haven't heard yet about something that's actually close to rollout. So I think right now to bridge until we're ready to get to get that answer approved or, or, or a actual solution to that issue, we have a bridge right now, which is update mRNA vaccines and get them to people's arms. And I actually think that as you brought up Flor Florian Cromer's work, I mean, there are less expensive uh, solutions like this uh, Newcastle disease virus vector that they've worked on with Peter Palese and, and, and Dr. Cromer, that it can be produced in eggs like the flu vaccines. And that seems to be pretty efficacious, I think, in their, in their trials in uh, Vietnam. I think they may have done some in Mexico as well. So it's important that we don't only cover the bases in countries like the US that can afford lots of uh, minus uh, 80 Celsius freezers and the uh, reliable electric grids to keep them running. We also want technologies that can make it to developing countries and places with, you know, uh, that need to use other, other and, and um, less expensive, more traditional approaches like, like raising a vaccine by growing a vector and embryonated, embryonated eggs and whatnot. So I think we need to push all the platforms forward that show us efficacious results, not just the ones that you know are, are good for us here in, in Western Europe or, or, or United States. No, that's great. Well, we could go on for a few more hours. I, we haven't even gotten into post viral chronic syndromes. And I mean, my oh, goodness. It'd be, fun. it'd be fun to talk another time. I really, really enjoyed yeah, uh, no, meeting both of you on, in, in person, not just you know tweeting and liking. So um, no, yeah, it's is, really, really, really an honor. Great. I mean, you guys are both, um, thanks for the kind words, by the way, is you, you guys are both you know, real authentic heavy hitters who have made uh, enormous impacts. I mean, you wouldn't be sitting where you're sitting if you um, hadn't done some very important work. So I'm truly humbled to be here. Oh, that's really kind of you, Jeremy. Thanks so much for taking the time. We're going to come back to you if we have another really bad family of variants. When the nasal vaccines hit and really contain the pandemic yeah. and a few other things, but we, we will come back uh, once we have some things to, to follow up on this. But this has been a great discussion. Thanks so much for yeah. all you're doing. And uh, you. we look forward to continued uh, dialogues with you. Thank you, Thank both. You, Jeremy.